that's a pretty cool effect, I think. Check, check, check. Hold on, it's froze up on me. Check, check, check. I don't know what that was. We we just entered a wormhole, guys. All right, welcome back. This is the Elude Stalwart channel. We're reading uh, the Disciple of Discipline, Chapter 5 of Never Finish, Unshackle Your Mind, and Win the War Within. Chapter 5, Disciple of Discipline. My vision narrowed as we pulled into the driveway at the crew cabin in Beckenridge, Colorado. It was just after 4 in the morning and dark as hell. I could barely see as I stepped carefully down the short staircase leading to the front door. Kish watched me, concerned, as I entered the house under my own power. I was hurting, but I held it together, and she knew I wouldn't show any weakness in front of the team. In fact, she'd assumed that I kept walking all day through our bedroom and on the ground floor into the bathroom where she could help me get undressed and cleaned up. But the thin thread between gripping tight to remain upright and presentable was fraying fast. And as soon as the guys were out of, sn out of sight, I snapped, or it snapped. My knees buckled and I fell to the bedroom floor. Kish was right behind me. She closed the door and locked it, ripped the cover off the bed and spread it on the floor beside me. Then she did her best to reposition me into the bedspread, giving me some semblance of comfort. She had no clue that her attentiveness made me anything but comfortable. Kish is a neat freak and she's borderline OCD. Dust, dirt, and potential germs for her radar pinging on high or germs for get her radar pinging on high alert. The first to come the She's the first to comment when there's something foul in the air. And here I was smelling like an old dog who had rolled in roadkill. My legs and feet were covered in, in mud and blood and my fingernails uh, rimmed with dirt. A paste of filth and sweat coated my skin from the toe to the scalp. My breath was rapid, rancid, and shallow. And the mild tremors of the filth and sweat coated my skin from toe to scalp. My breath was rapid, rancid. Oh, uh, I already read that part. Where, hold on, hold on. Bone rattling shivers. Okay, my breath was rapid, rancid, tremors. Oh, it's the light. The light's so bright. Let me change the color here, guys. This will do it here. Because I'm staring straight into this light here. Oh, look, you could change the font. Guys, guys, win the war with it. Oh, let's do it that way. Okay. I got to I got to find out where I was, guys. I got really lost cuz I was distracted. I changed it though. You could see that I changed it, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mild trimmers ever since okay, um we changed the the font and the size and stuff like that, so everything's offset. Okay, look, my breath was rapid, rancid and shallow, and the mild trimmers had only been visible to Kish in the car because she was paying close attention and to become and those had become bone rattling shivers. Then my bowels groaned. I knew it was about to get a whole lot worse. This was nothing new for me. Ever since my first ultra, the San Diego one day, the aftermath of every 100 mile race I'd completed included a tidal wave of pain and suffering, along with the humiliating loss of control of my most basic bodily functions. Kish knew that, but she had never experienced it firsthand. I was nervous that she wouldn't be able to handle it. The two of us are very different people. Kish is not an outdoorsy motherfucker. <laughs> if it weren't for me, she never would have heard of Leadville. Her idea of fun is spending the day on a pickleball court of golf course or chilling at a five-star resort. She's prissy as fuck. <laughs> I'm a holdover beast from a different age, but when it comes to work and hard discipline, that's where we marry up. She keeps up in the gym and on the road trails as a hard charger when it comes to business and understands my dedication to the grind in a way that no other woman or other person has in my life. Yet, yeah, aside from that one night in Nashville ER, she had only ever seen me as capable of enduring and withstanding almost anything and everything with little to no help, and often on very little sleep. I'd rarely, sh rarely showed her any vulnerability. So how would she feel about me when she saw I wasn't even capable of wiping my own ass? Ashamed and embarrassed, I told her that I was about to go down, and she looked horrified. Wait, David, not on the duvet! The what? I asked Delirious. The duvet. <laughs> I must still look confused as hell because I never heard the word duvet in my entire fucked up life. <laughs> you know the comforter goes inside the duvet. <laughs> Kish looked frazzled as she looked at the snow white linen beneath me 
which to her abject horror was getting sunk through on my most foul, foul post-race marinade. You're lying on it right now. <laughs> you mean blanket? I asked. She danced out of the room without answering and returned to the black trash bag and she uh, spread between me and the precious duvet like an open diaper. And then only, th only then did she tug my running shorts down to my thighs. My bowels unclenched and an ungodly stench rose up around us. As predicated, she had to wipe my ass because... <laughs> Why is it with someone farts? <laughs> this is a side tangent. <laughs> was there... <laughs> Every time someone farts, <laughs> everyone in the room goes... <laughs> <laughs> I just read that and I went... <laughs> <laughs> As predicted, she had to wipe my behind because I couldn't move. And then she helped me up to my knees so I could piss on some high-end decorative glass fruit bowl she had found upstairs. <laughs> in the kitchen while she clenched her teeth and stressed about what what it, this might do to her airbnb rating after all of that she peeled the shoes off my socks and, and the so shoes and socks off my feet she cleaned me up the best that she could and cocooned me in that fucking duvet <laughs> my eyes rolled up and began sagging in my eyelids i wasn't sleeping i was uh it, i was attempting to savor the uncontrollable shivers the filth my own sick stench and many flavors of pain the crushing agony in my hip flexors was searing. The only other time I felt anything like that was during the Wednesday night of my second hell week whenever I was rousted after a five minute power nap on the beach. Everyone else on my boat crew was getting a full hour, but not me. Psycho Pete, the instructor I hated most, <laughs> wanted a private audience. I remember trying to stand with that maniac in my face. It felt like my hips were trapped in a vice. The only thing that would have eased the throb excuse me, was curling up in the fetal position. So that's what I did in Beckenridge, tripping on how much pain the power has to bring you back in time. Tripping on how the pain has the power to bring you back in time like nothing else. As I lay there shivering and sweating at the same time, I could have sworn that back on Cor Coronado Island, getting wet and sandy. Oh, yeah, as I lay there shivering and sweating at the same time, I could have sworn I was back on Coronado Island getting wet and sandy. Uh, Kish was terrified. She watched me uh, and timed my arrhythmic heartbeats and, or my arrhythmic breaths and listened to my bones rattle as she mapped out emergency contingencies in her head. Was I in shock? Was I having some sort of altitude reaction? Breckenridge is a 9,600 feet. She was concerned my condition would deteriorate fast, but I wasn't worried about any of that. I knew that this was my old friend breakdown, my final phase of ultra. When I first got to endurance events, I loved the breakdown phase because, uh, phase because the suffering made me feel alive and reminded me that I'd gone all out. <laughs> this time I didn't relish it the same way, but I knew that the breakdown was a byproduct of an all out effort that if I explored the crevices of my mind, I would find a valuable lesson, which would tend to spill out with any, or which tend to spill out without, with any unraveling. So anytime you get an unraveling, you get lessons. Most people prefer to avoid breakdowns like this because the suffering can be so overwhelming. They just mark you forever, or it just might mark you forever. I embrace the breakdown and welcome the scarring. There is a hell of a lot of information in scar tissue. Scars are proof that the past is real. Physical scars never go away when you look at them. They bring you back to a specific place in time. But the scar tissue that builds up around that old injury is weak. Professional fighters who've been hit in the face thousands of times bleed faster than those who have never been punched. Once you've been cut deep, you're, ever, you're forever vulnerable to bleeding. The same is true for the mental and emotional scars that we all carry within us. The scars we cannot see. They might be invisible, but they're affecting us much more severely than physical scars. Mental and emotional scars are a weak spot, and they open up just as easily as physical scars unless we do the work to strengthen them. If you haven't dealt with your scars, they can alter your life path. You'll be prone to failure during your physical and emotional situations, whether that's during an athletic event, at work, or in your home life. And eventually, you'll land back in front of your mirror that never lies. Breakdown is its own kind of mirror. Whatever you're made of is laid out in front of you, and it's clear and plain. Your history and mindset become a weathered old map ridged with your scars. And if you read them like an archaeologist or an archaeologist on a dig, you might uncover the code you need to rise again and become better and stronger. Because there's no transformation without breakdown. And there's always another evolution, another skin shed. 
a better or deeper version of ourself waiting to be revealed. I did a quick inventory of my scars as I faded into that slippery headspace between waking and dreaming. Psycho Pete's voice trailed off, and another familiar yet faint voice that I couldn't quite place called out to me. David, wake up. My memory convulsed and bled into my reality, and I couldn't tell where I was or what was real. David, he said gruffly and louder. It's time to get up, boy. It was the voice of my grandfather, Sergeant Jack Gardner. Unlike those who embraced affectionate nicknames like Pop Pop or Papa or Grandpa, he'd instructed me to call him Sergeant Jack. And that set a tone for how things were going between us. Oh yes, he left more than a few scars etched in my brain, and he was shaking me awake just like old times. It was the summer of 1983 when we staggered up this long gravel driveway and arrived on his doorstep, underslept, underfed, and without possessions crammed in the back or with all of our possessions crammed into black trash bags. My mother knocked on the door. While we waited, I scanned the yard. My grandpa had a big property full of a full acre of land, including a wide, perfectly manicured lawn with train tracks along one side. There wasn't a blade of grass out of place and not a single weed in sight. That should have been my first warning. While my dad was convinced that my grandfather had been our escape had been behind our escape from Buffalo, he didn't witness our arrival or my grandmother Morna's wordless greeting in front of the porch. She opened the door, rolled her eyes, and waved us inside. Sergeant Jackson stood right, or Sergeant Jack stood right behind her with an expression and hair, uh, uh, with an expression of a drill instructor waiting for new recruits to get off the bus with their long hair and beards. <laughs> All went behind the ears. He had been a master sergeant in the Air Force and had retired long ago, but was dressed in one of his flight suits. I didn't recognize the look on his face because I was a disoriented young pup all covered in scar tissue. But when I went to boot camp for the first time, I saw it again. That day in Brazil, though he looked like a hero to me, I smiled and he did not smile back. It felt good to be there anyways. I was happy to be anywhere on Paradise Road. They were relieved that we all had gotten away from our father, but didn't mean, uh, but that didn't mean uh, room, board, and babysitting would be free. The first bill came due before dawn the next morning when I was awakened by a stiff shake of my shoulders. I opened my eyes and there was Sergeant Jack, still in uniform. Time to get up, boy, he said. There's work to do. I wiped my eyes and glanced at my brother who shrugged. It was dark outside and we were exhausted from the trip. And as soon as Sergeant Jack left the room, we fell back to sleep. The next wake up call came in the form of a glass of cold water thrown in our faces. Two minutes later, we were in the garage and kept this old metal desk from our military, or where he kept his old metal desk from the military. On the corner of that desk was a yellow notepad. The top of that page was titled Task List, dated marked 50530. I had no clue what those numbers meant until Sergeant Jack explained that in this house, uh, this house ran on military time. That was the moment I realized that there would be no adjustment period and no coddling whatsoever. My grandparents never expressed basic sympathy for what we'd been through. Sergeant Jack simply stared hard and went over the list and walked us through the garage as if we were new employees and needed to know where to find the rakes, the hoge, the hedge clippers, and the quiver of brooms and dustpans and just how to operate and clean this manual lawnmower. He didn't care how we divided up the work, just that we got it done and got it done on time. Each day started like that with an unwell, unwelcome wake-up call an itemized military timestamp task list, and a few, if any, words from the old man. Sergeant Jack was half black and half Native American, and though he was only five foot seven, he had a larger presence about him. He worked and cook as a cook in the Air Force and still dressed in the military attire every day. It was usually a flight suit or one of his battle dress uniforms or BDUs on weekends. His crisp dress blues were reserved for church and all other formal occasions. Sergeant Jack took great pride in de detailed stewardship. He cared about everything he owned. He had two separate two-car garages and four cars on the property, Cadillacs and Chevrolets from the mid-century. Like his well-tended house and garden, those were, cars were pristine. Born in 1905, he came of age in southern Indiana during the height of his Jim Crow, during the height of Jim Crow, when it was dangerous as hell to be a black man in America and a wrong word or look could spark a lynch mob. His parents were poor and he wasn't babied as a kid. His formal education ended in the fourth grade when he had to get a job to help support the family. 
So when I landed in his house, he passed along what he'd learned, what they taught him for work as far as he was concerned. He had a military pension. He owned his own house free and clear with the same car in every garages, and he had money in the bank. Sergeant Jack was squared the fuck away, and he got there with self-reliance and detail and discipline. Or self-reliance on detail and discipline. Each morning before he woke up, he walked the perimeter of his property surveying the lawn. Several trees and a long unpaved driveway blanketed in snow white gravel. The house had two porches, one on either side, and he liked them swept and the rain gutters cleared to breeze at all times because the storms come down hard in that part of the country. Sergeant Jack couldn't stand seeing a leaf litter or dust or weeds. Everything had to be immaculate. The daily list was always, or the daily task list was always at least 10 tasks long. Sometimes it stretched to over 20. The first order of business in the morning was to sweep both porches front and back, and after that I got to the rake and collect my bag, any stray leaves that had fallen overnight. Wow. In spring and summer, that wasn't a huge job, but in the fall, when the leaves turned, it took hours. Hedges and grass grew like crazy during the humid Indiana summer, and that meant mowing the lawn manually in a perfect grid and clipping all the hedges almost daily. Weeds were always a problem in the summer, and as soon as they began poking through the gravel on the driveway, I had to get on my hands and knees and dig the dirt out to pull those fuckers free. The gravel dug into my skin, leaving scrapes and bruises. To me, it didn't feel a whole lot different from scraping gum off the skate rink floor at first. In those early weeks, I took Sergeant Jass' tasks as a sign that no matter where I lived or who I lived with, I was bound to suffer at the hands of a bully. My scarred young mind was deep in the woe is me rinse cycle. So was my brother's. He didn't last long until on he didn't last long on Sergeant Jack detail and retreated to Buffalo pretty quickly. Crazy to think Buffalo seemed like it'd be the better option. I wasn't going anywhere, but that doesn't mean I enjoyed it. At first I despised the man and attempted to rebel. He'd come shake me awake and I wouldn't move, and then he'd splash water in my face and I took that off and I took that too. If I still didn't get up, he'd come to the bedside with me with a metal trash can and lid and whack it with a wooden spoon right next to my ear until I was up on the way to the garage to pick up my orders. I didn't yet realize that Sergeant Jack was no Trunnis. He was my Mr. Miyagi. Not in the sense that each chore came with a specific instruction or that those instructions would manifest in skills that would deliver karate tournament salvation. He never sat back and said, I'm teaching you how to be a responsible young man. Yet, I learned valuable life lessons. Many of us will keep people like Sergeant Jack in our lives, an elder or a teacher who refuses to tell us what we want to hear in the way that we want to hear it. When you're emotionally scarred like I was, any and every hard look or gruff reply or order or mandate can feel like a personal attack, and often we tune them out to our own detriment. It took me a long time to understand that there wasn't anything personal about Sergeant Jack's approach or his list. It was all transactional. His daughter, my mother, needed a place for us to stay, and the world's lodging isn't free. As far as Jack was a, uh, Sergeant Jack was concerned, that daily task list was the night bill to be paid. Not that my mom gave it a second thought. She was busy with a full load of classes at the local university and two part-time jobs as she scheduled as she kept for the next six years until she graduated with a master's degree. A master's degree. The bill would have been paid in my sweat. Once school started, or once school started, my work was divided into uh, before and after school sessions. There was rarely any respite. After I got home, schoolwork came first. Then I had to complete all the tasks on the list correctly before I was allowed to play basketball with my friends. At first, I had no idea doing a particular task meant uh, correctly meant. Well, I didn't know what doing a particular task correctly meant to the old man. The only direct feedback I got from him was a straight face nod, which meant he approved, or a shake of the head, which meant try again. I saw that a, uh, I saw that a hell of a lot. His head shake of doom stalked me on my nightmares, where I would mow a lawn and that never stopped growing out of control, or attempted to clear rain gutters that were rimmed with sawtooth blades and threatened to chop off my fingers. All things being equal, I prefer to be outside. I consider most of the house a no-go zone because as badly as I felt I was being treated by Sergeant Jack, I much preferred him to Morna. She was also of mixed race and could pass for white if she or if or when she needed to. 
She celebrated that fact by spraying the N-word around like an eco-lag exterminator hunting for a hive of cockroaches. More often than not, her favorite word landed on my head. For all the racists I met in Brazil, nobody called me N-I-double-G-E-R. More than sweet grandma Morna, which only heightened the feeling that I was in their personal slave, or that I was their personal slave. Months passed and the tyranny did not relent, but by then I knew exactly what Sergeant Jack expected from me. I knew how to cut the grass and rake my leaves and wash away the cars the way he wanted, but I felt sorry for myself because few, if any, of my friends had, to cho had chores to do at all, let alone complete daily military-grade task lists. Plus, my grandparents still hadn't demonstrated any empathy for what I'd been through during my first eight years of life. Clearly, they didn't understand me. I was housed in their guest room with the dated furniture and wallpaper. I didn't have a basketball poster on the walls. I wasn't given toys or cool sneakers or a stereo. Did they put out any effort to make that room more accommodating for a kid? Hell no. The only way that you get back at them what by doing is by doing a half-assed job instead of working hard on all the important tasks of the day. Of course, I was only victimizing myself. If I wasn't done before dinner time, they called me in. The meals were not kid-friendly. There were no burgers or hot dogs. It was chicken or roast meat with the side of collard greens, chitlins, and cabbage. I was expected to clean my plate whether I liked the food or not and then go back out and finish whatever tasks had remained undone. I worked well past sundown. I couldn't understand why my grandparents treated me this way. The only exp explanation in my jacked up eight year old brain could find was like my father, they hated me and resented me when, as a presence in their home, which is why in the early days, uh, earning Sergeant Jack's check mark of approval meant nothing to me. And as I sleepwalked through his tasks like a zombie, I figured any half ass attempt was good enough. Fuck it, and fuck him, I thought. I hated the old bastard and didn't care what he thought of me. Six months later, I still loathed the man and I changed my approach to the task list. I got up after the first wake-up call with no delay. There would be no more early morning baptisms for me. <laughs> Instead, I focused on the details Sergeant Jack always noticed and finished each job right the first time. That way, the only way I'd get any kind of free time is to play basketball. However, my new approach produced an unexpected side effect as well a sense of pride in a job well done. In fact, a sense of pride came to me more than just basketball time. When I, was washed his, when I washed his car collection, a weekly assignment, I knew every drop of water had to be wiped away with cameos before the first coat of wax. I used SOS pads to get the white walls gleaming and buff the hell out of every panel. I also used armor all on the dashboards and all the vinyl insides. I buffed the leather seats too. It bothered me if I saw streaks on glass or chrome. I was annoyed if I missed a spoil spot or cut a corner here or there or on any chore. I didn't know it at the time, but that was a sign that I was actually healing. When half-assed jobs don't bother you, it speaks volumes about the kind of person that you are. And until you start feeling a sense of pride and self-respect in what you do, no matter how small or overlooked those jobs might be, you will continue to half-ass your life. I knew every reason in the world to rebel as a and remain a lazy motherfucker. I had every reason in the world. I also sensed that it would only make me more miserable, so I adapted. But no matter how well I did or how fast I completed a task, there were never any attaboys or weekly allowances. No ice cream cones or surprise gifts. No hugs or high fives. In Sergeant Jack's mind, I was finally doing what I should have been doing all along. My grandpa's weren't, or my grandparents weren't ice cold to everyone. When my cousin came to stay for uh, Christmas in 1983, there were hugs and kisses and a plenty from uh, Morna and Sergeant Jack because, unlike my mother, his mom his mom insisted they treat her child with affection, not military discipline. The gifts piled piled up too. There were toys and clothes and barbecues and burgers and hot dogs. And those were grilled to order, followed by bowls of ice cream. Whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it, my cousin got it. David, come on over here for a minute. Sergeant Jack said while I eyeballed him, uh, while I eyeballed my cousin Damien as he scarfed down on his bowl of ice cream. He'd been there for two days and he enjoyed more ice cream than I had in six months. I got a gift for you too. I followed him, almost shocked until it became clear we were heading out into the garage <laughs> as usual. Evidently, it was time to find out what Christmas morning task list was like. Christmas was no different than the average 
Wednesday to my grandfather. He didn't stop and care if it was your birthday or holiday. The work would not stop. I grabbed the sheet of paper off his desk as he willed over my Christmas present and with a shiny new manual or lawnmower with my initial monogram or with my initials monogrammed on it <laughs> on the gleaming stainless steel wheel hubs. There was snow on the ground, so I knew I didn't need to mow the lawn that morning, but there's still been a sale on yard equipment at Western Auto and the old man could never pass up a sale. Merry Christmas, he said with a grin. My cousin was being treated like a prince, and the old motherfucker bought me out to the garage to troll me. <laughs> I guess I've had every, I've had a lot of merry fucking Christmases in my life. <laughs> Two separate events would soon change how I saw Sergeant Jack forever. In the new year, my mom and I moved up out of our subsidized seven dollar a month apartment in Lamplight Manor. The following summer, she enrolled me in the summer school down the road. One day after class let out. I walked home with a group of kids who lived nearby. One of them, a little girl named Meredith, lived down the street. And we uncovered, or we covered the last stretch together. Her father happened to be sitting in her front, on their front porch drinking a beer when we got to the house. And as soon as he saw me, he put that beer down. He leaned forward, stroked his beard, and glared at me like a mad dog. Mind you, while my grandmother called me an N-I-double-G-E-R, I had never experienced any racism in public before. I simply thought he was mad at his daughter whenever he barked, Meredith, get your ass inside. I didn't think his stress had anything to do with me. Later that evening, he called my mom and warned her that, they, that he was in the Ku Klux Klan. Tell your son to leave my daughter alone, he said. After she, got, if she, after she told him to go fuck himself, he said that he would pay Sergeant Jack a visit. Everyone knew Sergeant Jack in Brazil, Indiana. He was friends with the mayor and local leaders who all considered him to be a church-going patriot, a man of God and his word. He was proof that the American dream was real, and in the minds of any, many racist white boys in Brazil, he was one of the good ones. Clearly, this, foul, this fool thought Sergeant Jack would straighten her, out, uh, straighten her and me out, and my mom smiled at that thought. Please do, she said. Then she, sh she hung up and called her father. When I saw Meredith's dad again, a few years later, he was on my grandparents' front porch. He'd come by unannounced, but Sergeant Jack was prepared. He looped his pistol around his belt and wore it like a sidearm whenever he opened his front door. I was huddled inside behind my grandfather and, corner around, but, and around a corner but had a clear view whenever Meredith's father noticed Sergeant Jack's weapon and backed up a step. Sergeant Jack raised his chin another inch, looked the man dead in the eye, and but didn't say a word. Look, Jack, the Klansman said, if your grandson doesn't stop walking home from school with my daughter, we're going to have some problems. The only problems we're going to have, Sergeant Jack said, is a dead Klansman on my front porch if you don't get off my property. I ran to the door in time to watch the man turn around and get back in his truck and drive off. And then I looked over at Sergeant Jack, who nodded. It was the first time any adult had protect her protected me from harm. A few months later, I was in the driveway with Sergeant Jack and his friend Bill. While they worked hard on my grandfather's Cadillac, those two tinkered with cars almost every day. If they weren't changing spark plugs or checking oil, Sergeant Jack was flushing a radiator or steam cleaning an engine. When the day's job was done, Bill slammed the steel hood down without realizing Sergeant Jack's were still resting on the rim. The hood shattered his fingers on both of his hands, but he didn't make a sound. Bill lifted the hood, he said calmly, still in complete control. The blood drained from Bill's face when he realized what he'd done. He was so shocked it took a few seconds for him to jiggle the hood's release. When he finally got when he finally got it, Sergeant Jack pulled up his bloody hands free, walked calmly into the house and found my grandma or grandmother. Morna, he said, I think you better drive me to the hospital. Witnessing that changed me. I'd never been around such strength and composure. I didn't even know something like that was possible. And I thought if I could be as tough as him one day, all of the suffering in the hands of my father, the shoveling, the snow gravel, the raking the leaves, washing cars, cleaning rain gutters, clipping hedges, lawn mowing, it would all be worth it. I was still struggling to learn trust, to feel good about myself, and to find meaning in all the pain. But seeing how Sergeant Jack handled that situation, I learned that being tough could be my way out. I didn't mean my way out of Brazil. That wasn't at the top of my mind yet. I was looking for a way out of my fragile, wounded state of mind. And there was an old saying in the military that if you are stupid, you better be hard. Back then, I considered myself stupid. 
partly because that all the soft scar soft ass scar tissue was still so fresh it was hard to focus on my schoolwork and my response was simply to be lazy if i failed i didn't try if i if i failed because i didn't try did i really fail then i learned to cheat my way through sergeant jack's way didn't involve whining uh scheming or feeling sorry for yourself he was about gritting his teeth taking pride in everything that he did and dealing head on with whatever came his way for longer than i could rem remember i felt neglected and ignored i was bitter when my friends and cousins wouldn't play whenever they wanted to or they would play when they wanted to and watch television all day and wear fresh gear to school when would i ever get mine i wondered when would I get something for me and me alone? That day in the driveway was finally when I figured out uh, that Sergeant Jack's example was the gift I'd been hoping for all along. It was more impressive and satisfying than any present could be, tastier than any hamburger or hot dog, and sweeter than any ice cream sundae. It was the best and most important day in my miserable life so far. Respect, respect. He's a sergeant, so I'm gonna go a parade rest. You don't salute sergeants. Sergeant Jack was a hard ass teacher, but kids need hard ass teachers sometimes. I know that might hurt your ears, but because things are different now. We are warned the, of the lasting effects of stress on children and to compensate. Parents strategize about how to make their children's lives comfortable and easy. But is the real world always comfortable? Is it easy? Life is not G rated. We must prepare kids for the world as it is. Our generation is training kids to become full-fledged members of entitlement nation, which ultimately makes them easy prey for the lions among us. Our ever-softening society doesn't just affect children. Adults fall into the same trap. Even those of us who have achieved great things, every single one of us is just another frog in the soon-to-be boiling water that is our soft-ass culture. We take unforeseen obstacles personally. We're ready to be outraged at all times by evil bullshit of the world. Believe me, I know about the evil we have to deal with and more bullshit than most. But if you catalog your scars and use them as excuses or bargaining chips to make life easier for yourself, you've just missed an opportunity to become better and stronger and to grow. Sergeant Jack knew what awaited to me as an adult. He was preparing me for the grip of life. Whether he knew it or not, the man was training me to be a savage. The evolutionary equation is exact same for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a young person looking to tap into your power and become a great or midlife adult or senior who's never done a fucking thing but wants to achieve something before it's too late. Or maybe you've achieved a lot, but you're overcoming injury or illness or you're simply uninspired and caught in an emotional and physical quicksand. First, you must recognize that you've fallen off or are perpetually falling short. Next, accept that you're on your own. Nobody will come to save you. They will show you an example like Sergeant Jack did for me, and I'm doing that for you right now, but it'll end up but it will end up it will be up to you to do the work. Then you must become a disciple of discipline. Even after we moved into our own place whenever mom had my work or had to work late or go out of town, I'd spent the night at Sergeant Jack's, and sure enough, there would be a wake up call and a bill in the morning in the form of a task list. And yes, like my dad, Sergeant Jack was a mean old man who expected me to do what he said and work for free. But unlike Trunnis, he wrapped something valuable in the discipline he served. And whenever I put maximum focus to each task, I earned a sense of pride and I hadn't been able to find anywhere else. But it didn't last. Eventually I grew to be a, a rebellious teenager and I sagged my pants down and flipped the middle finger at authority and I was well on my way to flunking out. I'd become a punk, but Sergeant Jack didn't try to tell me how to dress or act beyond insisting that whenever I come across as an adult or when I come across an adult, I had better greet them with sir or ma'am. And although he and though he knew about each and every radical taunt and episode of vandalism I had endured, he had no intention of stepping in to fight my battles anymore. I was almost grown and they were my storms to na navigate not his. Like many disaffected teenagers, I wasn't living a mission-driven life. I was merely existing. I had become lazy and my attention to detail was long gone because I didn't have a guy, that guy looking over my shoulder on a daily basis to keep me on point. 
The feeling of pride that I had back in the day of working at Sergeant Jack's property was nowhere to be found, but consider this to be a kind of emergency. I was only 17, and even then, normal kids uh, that are young get plenty of space to do a lot of uh, nothing, a whole lot of nothing much. We've all heard parents say, he's only a teenager, or she's only in college, when explaining away bad habits or poor choices. The question is, when is the right time to start living instead of merely existing? My time came whenever I received my letter or a letter informing me that I was failing my grades and that would keep me from graduating high school, which would also end my career in the Air Force before it started. The next day I went back to Sergeant Jack and began staying over at his place more often. I asked for his task list and I wanted to work in his yard. I craved discipline because I had a sense that it might save me. That's the beauty of discipline. It trumps everything. A lot of us are born with minimal talent, unhappy with our own skin and genetic makeup with which we were born. We have fucked up parents. We grow up bullied, abused, or diagnosed with learning disabilities. We hate our hometown, our teachers, our families, and damn near everything about ourselves. We wish we could be born again as some other motherfucker in some other time and place. Well, I am proof that rebirth is possible through discipline, which is the only thing capable of altering your DNA. It's the skeleton key that can get you past all the gatekeepers and into each and every room you wish to enter. Everyone's built to keep you the fuck out, or even the ones that are built to keep you out. It's so easy to be great nowadays because so many people are focused on efficiency, to get the most for themselves with the least amount of time and effort. Let all of them leave the gym early, skip school, and take sick days. You commit to being the motherfucker that will never, with a never-ending task list. This is where you make up the difference in potential, by learning to maximize what you do have. You will only level up the playing field, but also, or you will not only level the playing field, but also surpass those born with more natural ability and disadvantages than you. Let your hours become days, then weeks, then years of effort, allowing the discipline to seep into your cells until work becomes a reflex as automatic as breathing. With discipline as your medium, your life will become a work of art. Discipline builds mental endurance because whenever effort is your main priority, you stop looking for everything to be enjoyable. Our phones and social media have turned uh, too many of us inside out with envy and greed as we get inundated with the other people's success. Their new cars and houses, big contracts, resort vacations, and romantic getaways. We see how much fun everyone else is having and feel like the world is passing us by. So we bitch about it and then wonder why we're not where we want to be. When you become disciplined, you don't have time for that bullshit. Your insecurities become alarm bells reminding that you, uh, reminding you that doing your chores or homework to the utmost of your ability and putting in extra time on your job or in the gym are requirements for a life well lived. A drive for self-optimization and daily repetition will build your capacity for work and give you confidence that you can take on more. With discipline as your engine, your workload and output will double, then triple. What you won't see, at least not at first, is the fact that your own personal evolution has begun to bear fruit. You won't see it because you'll be too busy taking action. The discipline doesn't have to be a belief system. It transcends class, color, and gender. It cuts through all the noise and strife. And if you think that you're behind the eight ball for whatever reason, discipline is the great equalizer. It erases all disadvantages. Nowadays, it doesn't matter where you're, where you're from or who you are. If you're disciplined, there will be no stopping you. Believe me, I know none of that comes easy. I struggled to get up before the sun on the first morning back to Sergeant Jack's detail, and I hadn't dealt with the 0500 wake-up call in so long. It felt too sudden. I was lethargic as hell, and the bed sucked me back into its cushy has arms. They, the pull to stay lazy was stronger than it ever had been. That's how it works whenever you're trying to change. The call to remain complacent will only grow louder until you silence it with a pattern of behavior that leaves no doubt about your mission. Lucky for me, I knew the stakes were too high to fall into that trap. So, so high that I didn't have time to wake up slowly. I needed to knock out my chores before school so I could hit the books after I got home. Still drowsy and dragging, I remember whenever I ran or played ball, and I felt better afterwards. I was just a dumb kid. I didn't know anything about science of endorphins or how they trigger and energize positive feelings on the body and brain after a workout. 
but I knew how it felt and that was good enough. I dropped down and hit the mat and hit a uh, max set of push-ups. By the time I was done, I had the energy I needed to run the garbage, the uh, run to the garbage, grab my task list and get to work. That became my new pattern. Wake up earlier than I had to, do my max set of push-ups and then get cracking. That was, it was during those days of struggle and striving when I didn't know if I would actually graduate or be accepted by the Air Force. When I first realized that I am at my best when I am a uh, disciple of discipline. Oh, that I first, okay, well, I, I didn't get that. It was during those days of struggle and striving when I didn't know if I would actually graduate or be accepted by the Air Force that I first realized I am at my best when I am a disciple of discipline. The further I got away from it, from Sergeant Jack, the became I, the worse I became. While I still didn't like waking up early and doing most of the chores I had to do, there were very things that had turned me into something that I could be proud of. I also knew Sergeant Jack wouldn't always turn around or be around to lead by example. He was already in his late eighties and had started to slow down old age. Oh, and started to slow down. Old age had crept up on him. He slept much more and didn't move very well, which meant it was time to learn how to hold myself accountable. His task list had taught me how to prioritize an attack each day with a plan of action so that I started getting up before him. I'd do my push-ups, walk the per perimeter of the property well before dawn, and assess what needed to be done. By the time his, he, he was at his desk sipping coffee, I was already working. Once he saw that I took initiative not only uh, the, to do the tasks that would normally be on my list, but to identify additional work to be done, his list shrank and then disappeared altogether. At home, Sergeant Jack's task lists evolved into my accountability mirror, which helped me build habits necessary to graduate on time and pass the ASVAB and enlist in the Air Force. From then on, whenever I had a purpose or a task in front of me, I didn't consider it until I'd become uh, competed until I completed the best of my ability. When that's the way you live your life, you no longer need a task list or an accountability mirror because you'll see the, the grass is high and you'll cut the grass right then. If you're lagging behind school or work, you'll study your ass off late and take care of business. When it came to lose 100 pounds to become a SEAL, I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to tap back into being the disciple of discipline, but I didn't need a task list. Writing it down would have only cut my into my work time and I have a single minute and I didn't have a single minute to spare. Let me get some water. Once those task lists were a burden today, I burn with an inner drive shaped by doing the shit that I didn't want to do over and over again. And it won't let me relax until I've done what needs to be done every damn day. My post Leadville breakdown was physically challenging yet mentally exhilarating because it allowed me to bask in my power of mind. The hard work it took to get me back at the starting line of Leadville demanded that I go back to being a disciple of discipline that Sergeant Jack helped me create. Granted, I still didn't know what his objective was. He was, was he trying to shine a path for me uh, forward to make me better or did he just want free labor? In the end, it didn't matter. It was up to me to interpret why he did it, what it meant and spin it to create forward momentum. It will always be up to you to find a lesson in every shitty situation and become wiser and stronger and better. No matter what comes on your head, you must find a glimmer of light, remain positive, and never treat yourself like a victim. Especially if you intend to thrive in a harsh world where you have to work for everything that matters. I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about self-respect, self-love, and self-mastery. Minutes before waking up, to the morning after Leadville, rank as fuck with my shitty shorts still looped around my thighs, I flashed to one of the last times I saw Sergeant Jack alive. It was at my graduation from basic training in the Air Force. In spite of his poor health, he was adamant about attending. And as a World War II vet, he was given a VIP seat on the dais, or the dais among the brass. All years later, or all the years I knew him, he never said good job to me. I never once heard him say, I love you. But when they announced my name and I marched across that stage in my dress blues to officially become an airman like him, we locked eyes and I watched one solitary cheer shake down his cheek. Sergeant Jack was beaming and it was obvious that he was proud as hell to be my grandfather. That's good. That was good, guys. That was good. There's a picture right there. Woo! Beast mode.
Me and Sergeant back Jack at the graduation from basic training. Respect. Up next is Evolution 5. All right, guys, what do we learn? Disciple of discipline. How to become a disciple of discipline. It seems like uh, being proactive helps, but it also really helps getting one of those mentors like early on. I myself, I had my grandpa. My grandpa was in the army. He was a, a MP in the army. My father, he was in the Navy, and I think he made it to like E4 in the Navy. So I had some military background. Uh, I also have my stepfather who was in the military. He was an army uh, NBC specialist. So I definitely did have a lot of uh, head starts with, with when it comes to like nose to the grindstone, like discipline chores and like there were pats on the back though. Like I got pats on the back and uh, I always felt like I was being like boosted up and lifted. It was still just like Goggins though. Like when he goes to his grandpa's house, like it was like that for me. <laughs> we had a lot of chores and lawn work and stuff, but like my parents were sweet. They were sweet to us. They, they always treated us really well. But uh, yeah, I mean, disciple discipline guys. The discipline is the shortest path to freedom. It's 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 like the the road to freedom's paved with paved with with choices that were made from a, a place of discipline and intention and, and growth and stuff. All right, guys. Till next time. Peace. I ain't gonna lie. He got me choked up a couple of times. I got choked up uh, once or twice. This this stuff resonates. Peace, peace.